I think I'm here, not that I've actually managed to produce any work for Space Syntax, but we're neighbours and we have good conversations. And um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think it's there's th th these tools that have been developed are, are useful in so many ways. And we were just talking before about um, the fact that there's this, been this huge rise of um, uh, citizen mapping um, with the, the tools that have become available. And um, the excitement, really, of our times where these things can be layered um, together to, to really reflect the true complexity of the city, which I think hasn't been the case before. So I, I'm going to talk about um, the case <coughs> for curation in the city, where um, Yolanda had the, those um, horizontal um, bars between the prime and the creative. Actually, that creative space is under threat. I mean, you just got rid of three little sheds, didn't you, in Covent Garden? Mm -hmm. And then there's Hackney Wick that's under threat. So I think that there, there's not probably that much room to be complacent. And if we really um, want um, our public space to be um, full of um, people who um, perhaps know each other, keep triangulating their relationships, um, are not just passing through, but uh, create neighborhoods in the city, then we have to work really hard um, at, at preserving the diversity of the space. Um, we've um, been interested in this soft architecture for a while, and <coughs> most of these projects here, which we group under something we call adaptable neighborhoods, um, dot com, um, is uh, our, our self-initiated projects, which came out of competitions that we won and there was a bit of money to investigate why, for instance, the edge of um, cities in the Midlands are um, considered to be um, of no value, why there are negative property values when they're right next to the town centres. Um, there's a kind of post-industrial malaise that um, infects all of that area, so it seems as if incremental development is only just now becoming, um, um, you know, considered a kind of sensible approach um, to those areas. We, we started something in Camden where we were asking them for £5,000 to look at how we could um, take Leather Lane Market, which was down on its knees after having been dug up for the water mains, and create a mapping there where we, um, uh, working with the shops and also with the stall holders, could create a more friendly space. And I'll show you a slide of that in a minute. And this Canning Town Caravanserai, which is a hugely expensive, mad, ash sacular experiment into um, how to make um, a place central, which feels very peripheral to everybody except for the people who live there. Because, of course, when you live in a place just like a child, it's very central to you. And um, that's kind of interesting. So um, the Leather Lane Stars idea was that usually when you go out in, into a market, you, the first time you might ask somebody's name um, of a stall holder and have a lovely banter, and then the next time you've forgotten his name, and so you actually feel quite embarrassed, and then you start doing this kind of like, maybe, maybe I'll walk by quite quickly. So this was, this was a way you could just click on a name and see what they were um, selling, and we were doing the same thing with the shops and the pubs. Um, we still would like to do that kind of um, more active mapping in, in London. We think it's really important. This is the caravanserai, which is um, we have for another two years. It's a little space here, which is actually a huge space here, which um, acts as a, a, um, a place which we call a caravanserai because caravanserais were the trading posts on the Silk Road. And it was a way that um, you could do your business, you could um, meet local people who are hosting you, and you could um, pass culture along, along um, from east to west. So there's lots of activity that's taken place there, and it really is building up to being quite something quite interesting. And we've used little bits of architecture um, which have been made with local people to create um, moments of um, mix. So there is performance, there's making, there's eating together, there's... Um, hanging out near the gate and, and <clears throat> things like that. But I want to get back to the question of the evening, which is um, how do we save the dying high streets and the uh, monocultural business districts? And there have been certain ideas over the last few years, like, hey, if we have a business improvement district, we can get everybody together and um, we can create a better public realm. But actually, that hasn't really worked that well. It's really just done a bit of uh, group recycling. 
And um, it, it has to be said that Covent Garden is doing well, but there's lots of peripheral areas in, not peripheral, central areas in different parts of London, which are not doing so well. So people have been quite gloomy about that because, you know, there's the internet and it's um, all dying. But I did this sort of strange little drawing just to say that if you kick over an ant's nest, you do get, the, the ants go a bit mad for a while, but they um, find their way again. And I think we will find our way because the, the, the point is, is that people have a need to be together in the city and it is quite a deep instinct. Um, so now I thought, oh, well, I will do something sensible now, uh, do a SWOT analysis about <laughs> what, what's going for, for the city and, and, and a, a real city culture as opposed to a campus, as Yolanda was saying. I think that the, the city is the big stage in life. It's, it's a wonderful place to, um, to perform and also just to be quiet and watch other people perform. It's, um, there's a natural feeling that anything could happen, that there's, there's a wonderful chaos to it, which could, um, you know, the Dick Whitting thing about the streets of gold is still um, true. And people are naturally curious. I suppose the weaknesses are that the culture is sort of feeding itself, that sort of um, Guy Debord idea about the city of spectacle, the idea that we are um, consuming our own consumption is a bit scary. And um, brands and creatives in London, they're, they're working in Berlin and Copenhagen and everywhere, are working on this. And we get these experiences which sort of feel real, but then they feel a bit plastic as well. There's also the internet, people are buying stuff there, there's the rat run, there's all the, the divisions that we have in our society, the, the social silos between class and race, and the fact it's really expensive and people have to live in zone six. What we got going for us, there's um, this idea that we can actually, we could use our office blocks in the evening, we could um, you know, do, do lots of more clever things with time management and digital things. We've got the citizen map mapping that's going on, which I think is, is really exciting when it's mixed in with a very strong indie network which is developing. And we've got all this slack space which we can really harness and use creatively. Um, so, you know, um, this is a, a little bit uh, more of a fantasy, but developed from Fred's ideas um, of how we can actually take retail right up to the roofs and enjoy that, and we can live and work in the same buildings. This is the, the illusion, really, that you can um, ch make choices, even if you're in an IKEA environment, um, that that, that is, is, is a fantastic thing. Um, and then I'll just very quickly just go through some slightly fantastical ideas, I suppose, probably only like 10% off reality, but of what could happen with an empty shop front. So you could say that there's a shop and it's selling things, there are the little mannequins holding, you know, wearing the clothes. Why not have real people wearing those clothes doing real things? And that kind of layering that you get from the street could be a fantastic um, uh, way of enriching the retail culture, but also um, saving all those air curtains and the environment so you have a double facade and a double richness. There's also the, the idea, why have our institutions all locked away? Why, why don't we sell straight to the consumers and the students by showing them you know, all of the stuff that's being projected and the, the project work that's going on? Um, why don't we have meeting rooms that are booked as cars? I know we do already, but why can't they be in single units? We've got all the mapping devices to, so people can find a lovely meeting room in Peckham or in Tooting and enjoy that difference in the different centres. Um, you know, at the same time, you can also do your own branding for, for pop-up reasons. Um, you can also, sh with your friends, you, you can get more support if you're, you're starting a, a small business um, to, to take a space and divide it into seven or something. There's also the fact that you could use these dead shops to just store stuff that then you sell on a counter straight to the street. So it is in all um, a, a market store. Um, and, of course, the whole 3D printing, the fascination and the romance of actually making stuff for real that you can buy right there is, is another thing. Um, and also uh, the excitement of um, immersive environments where you step off the street and you're in a completely different world, and that could be everything from neighbourhood forum um, projections to horror films or, you know, late-night um, um, raves. Um, and this is, this is one that we've actually done ourselves. We've got a garage around the corner from here, and every so often we want to have a dinner party, but it's just a garage, and cars park in there. So we take a sort of roll of um, backdrop paper and roll it out, hang it from the ceiling, and then suddenly you've got this incredibly white, perfect interior. And we think, 
there's quite a, a lot of fun to be had. And then, of course, you need counterpoints to the buzz, so I think that you need to save some crannies in the city for that.